I'm going to start off today with a message, not a message, a verse that my wife texted me. I've told you this before, but I often wake up in the mornings to verses that my wife has had because it's just who she is. She's, she's always had her quiet time almost completely finished before I ever even get out of bed. So you feel like a total loser from the jump, right, when you get up. And then I wake up to these verses, and, um, and I love them, and it's amazing. In fact, hey, speaking of her, how many of you were here last week for Mother's Day weekend when Jill spoke? Wasn't that fantastic? Except for all the lies she told about me? Yeah, if you weren't here, my wife spent about half her sermon uh, telling a camping story, and um, she didn't paint me in the best light or the best picture. You know what I mean? She made me sound fairly unmanly in multiple ways. And uh, in fact, while she was telling these stories, I was sitting next to my son, Ethan, and he goes, Dad, he goes, you sound like the worst husband ever right now. (laughs) And I go, I know. And he goes, problem is she's not lying. (laughs) So I'm not talking to either of those two right now. Jill sent me this verse. This is going to be our, uh, our theme for today, Isaiah 46, 9. Remember carefully the former things which I did from ages past. Remember carefully the former things which I did from ages past, for I am God and there is no one else. I am God and there is no one like me. This verse is being written from Isaiah, speaking on behalf of God to a group of people that are absolutely overwhelmed, scared, sad, frustrated, confused, anxious, depressed, all of it. You ever had one of those days where something happens and all of a sudden you feel so overwhelmed that you're like, I don't even know what to do. You know what I'm talking about? And some of them are funny and some of them aren't. Last time me and Jill were about to sell our house here in Denver, we, we had all these showings set up the next morning and the whole house is clean and they take pictures and the whole thing. And we last minute decided, you know what, what we ought to do is we ought to touch up some of the trim. So we got out this box that had like six gallons of paint in it and I start touching up the trim and then I put the lid back on, set it in the box, we go out to dinner. I don't know what happened while we were at dinner. Somehow the paint can flips over, and we come back, and we walk in the kitchen, and we're like, da-da-da-da-da. A whole gallon of paint went into the box, through the box. It's on the whole dining room table, and our table was like slats, so it's leaking through the slats. All the plastic chairs are full of paint and onto the floor. It's like someone just went in our kitchen, took a gallon of paint, and went like this, and I just went. Like, I don't even know where to start. How do you clean this up? I don't even know what to do. You ever had that? But sometimes it's, it's, not, it's not funny. It's like, I got some news, and I feel so overwhelmed. I don't even know what to do. There was an accident. There was a tragedy. There was a diagnosis. There was a breakup. There was a financial thing. Something happened at work. Like, life just happens sometimes, and we feel so overwhelmed, we don't even know what to do. That's who this verse is being given to. And, and the answer, God says, to your feeling of being overwhelmed is to remember carefully. The title of today's message is Overwhelmed and Don't Know What to Do. Overwhelmed and Don't Know What to Do. That's who this verse was given to. And now it's being given to us, obviously. And so it applies to our situations of feeling overwhelmed and don't know what to do. If you're feeling overwhelmed today, if you're dealing with fear or you have some confusion or frustration or anxiety or depression, whatever you're going through, this is for you. And it's interesting because what God was saying, if you read the whole chapter and you start to get like some context about what this verse is saying, what you find out is is this group of people is really struggling and they don't know who to turn to. They don't know what to turn to. So they start worshiping false gods. In fact, some of the rich people started taking their their gold and their silver and melting it down and actually forming little false gods. And God starts mocking their false gods. He goes, "You, you carry this thing everywhere you go, and then you put it on a shelf, and it doesn't go anywhere until you move it again. And when you talk to it, it doesn't talk back. And does it answer your prayers? Mm mm. Does it help you? Mm mm. He's like mocking these false gods. And the whole thing is, he's like, the things you're turning to, 
They're not helping you. Would you consider turning to me? And, and I know that that might sound scary, but would you consider turning to me? Because I'm like no other God. I'm like nobody else. Remember the things I already brought you through? And he goes, remember that thing you had with the Midianites and you were all scared to death and you were overwhelmed? And remember how I brought you through that? If I can get you through that, I can get you through this. Would you turn to me? Remember that thing that was going on with the Philistines and you guys were scared to death and overwhelmed and I did some miracles and I got you through that and if I can get you through that, I can get you through this. Would you turn to me? He says, remember when you were stuck at the Red Sea and, and the, the Egyptians were coming back to try to take the entire nation of Israel and put them back into slavery and you're stuck at the Red Sea and don't know what to do? Remember I did that miracle and I got you out of that situation and if I could get you through that, I can get you through this. Would you turn to me? That's what he's saying. When you're overwhelmed and don't know what to do, he says one of the best things you can do is to begin to remember carefully what I've done. We're going to look at an Old Testament and a New Testament uh, passage today. First, Joshua 4. If you have a Bible or your phone, you want to flip to it or whatever you got, we're going to be in Joshua 4. And this is an amazing part of Scripture. I love this piece of Scripture. I talk about it often. But one of, the, one of the main messages that's going to come out of this scripture is, same thing, when you feel overwhelmed, remember carefully what I've done for you. All right, let's read. Joshua 4, we're going to start in verse 1. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, now we got to stop for a sec, because what, what happens is, is we read that and we go, oh, the whole nation crossed the Jordan, cool, what happened next? And he's like, no, 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 stop. If you were to talk to anyone back there that was there that day, this was not a, eh, we crossed the Jordan. No, this was a crazy day where we thought we were going to die and we thought God had forsaken us and we thought God told us to take a step of faith and we got in the river and he, he blocked, he like dammed up the river many miles away so he did a miracle, but it was gonna take a long time for the water to get to us. So we were in the water trying to trust God in the floods, in a situation where people are going to die, where family members are going to die and we were scared to death and then finally the water gets down and all of a sudden it's dry ground and you should have seen it, the whole river, it's dry ground. I'm telling you, we sprinted. You should have seen how fast I We sprinted across this thing because we don't know when the water's going to come back. And when it comes back, it's going to kill people. So we sprinted across and we just got to the other side. And all of a sudden, God goes, hey, why don't you send some people back? What? We just choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the, from the middle Go back to the center of your worst fear and grab a memory from that. From right where the priests are standing and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. And then God continues to download to Joshua what the plan is. And so Joshua grabs the guys and goes, guys, guys, come here real quick. Come here. Hurry, hurry, hurry. We don't know when the water's coming back. Here's what God said. We got to send some people back. What? Are you crazy? Are you sure? You're a brand new leader. Are you sure you heard from God? I think I did. You got to go back. Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, where you were most afraid. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of Israel, Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? You tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. He said, I want you to go back to that time you were most afraid, and I want you to grab a big old memory, put it on your shoulder, and bring it over here, because we're going to start stacking up these memories, and we're going to build ourselves a memorial. Why? Because God knew what they didn't that although he was giving them the promised land, they were gonna to have to go fight 31 battles to take possession of it, which means 31, these aren't just, this isn't like doesn't happen in an afternoon. This is 31 seasons of their life where they would be scared for their own lives, scared for their family's lives, no clue what tomorrow holds. You wanna talk about anxiety and fear and insecurity and all of it. It's 31 seasons of scared to death, overwhelmed. So what's God say? When you get to that first season 
and you feel overwhelmed, and you start to wonder if you can trust me, I want you to look back at that memorial you built. I want you to look back at that memorial that you built, that you, you, you picked up some memories, and you stacked them on top of each other, and I want you to look back at that memorial and go, yeah, this feels crazy, and the walls of Jericho can't be, we can't, we can't, this is impossible, we're overwhelmed. Oh, but wait, we don't have to be scared because he did that. Look back to the memorial, and if he got me through that, he can get me through this. That's the take-home phrase. Would you guys go ahead and put it up on the wall behind me? I want you to say this with me. We're going to say it about four or five times. We'll stop saying it when I feel like you're saying it with some conviction. We'll have to figure out the cadence together. You ready? He got me through that. He'll get me through this. He got me through that. He'll get me through this. Say it like you mean it. He got me through that. He'll get me through this. Last time. Now, this time, I want you to picture something that God's actually brought you through. Ready? He got me through that. He'll get me through this. That's the takeaway. That's why we build memorials. That's why. So, so let, me, let me show you what this looks like in the wild, in real life. I got asked to go on a uh, three-day vacation, me and Jill, and it was going to be two other couples. And we had just met one of the couples, and we didn't know the other couple, okay? Right before that, I had been at a dinner where we were playing this conversation game of, hey, if you, could, if you could meet anyone in the world and have dinner with them and, like, hang out with them for a day, who would it be and why? You ever play that game? If not, you should. It's a great conversation for dinner. You see all kinds of insights into, into your friends. My wife, I remember her answer was uh, Queen Elizabeth. I don't remember her why, but I remember thinking, that sounds about right. You're so freaking classy. Um, Showing to meet Queen Elizabeth. It came to me, and they were naming like professional athletes and presidents and all this. And Sean, if you could meet anyone in the world, who would it be and why? <clears throat> I said, if I could meet anyone in the world and talk to him for an evening, it would be Pastor Craig Rochelle. And they're like, what? And I'm like, I just, I have so much admiration from him. I think he's one of the best leaders I've ever seen. I want to be generous with my life, and he's one of the most generous pastors and leaders of a giant organization that I've ever seen. I believe God's blessing in them because of their generosity, and he's just good at everything he does, and I want to get better at leading a church, so I want to see him. That was my answer. Okay. Guy asked me to go on a three-day vacation. It's going to be me and Jill, this couple, and then he goes, I go, who's the third couple? He goes, oh, Craig and Amy Groeschel. My heart just, I mean, like, I, all of a sudden, anxiety. Like, I don't really want to meet him. I just said I wanted to meet him. Because I know me. I have about three minutes worth of interesting things to say, and then after that, I'm done. I got nothing else. If you talk to me for four minutes, you lose all. There's no cool left. I got three minutes of like, yeah, man, and the thing and the deal. What's up, brah? I see you could talk. I'm good at that. Five minutes in, I don't know what to say anymore, and I get real awkward, and I don't want to do it with my hands. And you know what I mean? Like, that's, I was, I'm scared to death to go on this trip. So we go to the first dinner, and everything went fine. At one point, Jill actually, like, whispered over to me. She's like, Sean, act normal. <laughs> I was trying, but I was like, I didn't know what to say, so I got super quiet, and then it was super awkward. And, and then I, you know, it was just weird. But I got through it. At the end of the dinner, they go, hey, guys, great news. Tomorrow, we're going to go on an all-day boat ride out in the ocean. All of a sudden, I went, I'm going to die. I started having a panic attack. I didn't actually start having a panic attack. I could feel anxiety coming on. Those of you who deal with this, you know we have the ability to feel anxious about a future thing that might make us feel anxious. I can have a panic attack over something that might cause me to have a panic attack. So I go back in our little bedroom, and I'm like, babe, I can't do this. She's like, why? I go, you know me. I'm claustrophobic. She's like, how can you be claustrophobic out in the middle of the ocean? It's all wide open. I go, no, 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 no. You're stuck on the boat. If you get off the boat, you die. I'm claustrophobic. You're trapped. It's an invisible cage. This is funny, but this is real for me. And I was like, I got, babe, I can't go. I'm going to have a mental breakdown in front of the person I most look up to in this world. I can't do it. My wife loves boats. But she was like, all right. She goes, we'll just, we'll tell them tomorrow morning that um, thank you for the offer. We're going to stay here. You guys have a good day. I was like, you serious? She was. So we go to bed. Well, I can't sleep because I feel like such a bad human because my wife loves boats 
and I got this defect in my head that makes no sense to anyone else, and I'm going to keep my wife from a great day because of my... And so I had actually been talking to the church about making a list of things that God has done in your life. And so I got out my phone. It's like two, three, four in the morning. I don't remember what time it was, but it was late. And I start making a list. I just start typing in things on my phone that God had brought me through. And I remember the first one was like, your mom was a teenage heroin addict and she put you on a stranger's porch and she jumped off a bridge to kill herself. And that kid right there shouldn't have many good chances in life, but God got you through it. I wrote that down. I wrote down all kinds of stuff. I wrote down when, when, when I was 24, I started having panic attacks for the first time in my life and, and, and sat down at a table to take my own life one day, but God got me through it, and I wrote that down. At, at one point, I decided to intern and become a pastor, and I was scared every single day because I didn't exactly grow up pastorally. I never hardly ever been to church, don't know the stories. Now I'm training to be a pastor, and I'm like, I gotta learn the story so I can preach to somebody. Like, I, what am I doing? I was scared to death, but God got me through it. One time, God put it on me and Jill's heart to sell everything we had and move to Denver and try to start a church. And we had no job and no money and no family there and no health insurance. And my wife was pregnant and it was crazy and I was scared to death, but God got us through it. I started writing down all these things. I started building up some faith. He got me through that, he got me through that, he got me through that, he can get me through this. We woke up the next morning, we're getting ready. Jill's like, okay, I'll go tell him that we're not gonna ride the boat. I go, no, 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 I got a list. She's like, huh? I go, no, you don't need to know. But he got me through that and that and that. He's going to get me through this. Let's go ride a boat. And we went on a boat ride. And I got to meet Pastor Craig and hang out with him. And now he's one of my really good friends. And it's just kind of a silly analogy, but it's so true. I needed to build a memorial to look back on. And that started to, I needed to remember carefully some things that God had already done in my life, and it gave me the faith to take on some things that scared me in the, in the present. Does that make sense? And here's what's very interesting. I want you to know this about what we're talking about today. Some of you are struggling right now. It's just life. Some of you are in a real tough spot right now. Here's what I want you to know. God is with you. God is good. God is working. He has a plan, even if you don't feel it or understand it. He's going to get you through this. And right now, this gigantic struggle, one day you're going to turn around and it's actually going to be a testimony. You're actually going to turn around and go, I thought all I saw was a struggle, but it's actually now a memorial. And I look at that situation and go, if he could get me through that, then he can get me through this. What starts as a struggle, if we'll let it, will turn into a memorial. I'll show you what I mean. I found, this, I found this journal in my office last night. This journal, I don't, I'm not much of a journaler. Uh, in the whole 17 years of the church, I have a handful of journals that I've written in, but none of them are full. I'm just, I'm not much of a journaler. But in 2004, I started journaling. And what I'm about to read to you is some passages that I wrote. And it was, I had told my pastor that I thought I was called to start a church. So he nicely told me, you can work here for two more months, and then you're gone. And I was like, oh, I didn't expect that. Okay. Um, weird. And so now I know I'm going to lose my job in two months. I think I'm called to start a church. I have no experience. Nobody's backing us. No church planting organization. No money. Our pastor told me as nicely as he could, we won't support this. And I don't know where to go. I'm scared to death. All I felt was struggle. All right, this is July 10, 2004. God, help me to have faith. Help me to make this jump. I'm excited and scared all at once. Is this part of a test? If so, please help me to pass. If not, I ask for comfort and peace. I need you to help me lead my family. I love you so much. July 11. 2004. I wrote a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter to you. And then I ended the, the entry like this. Thank you for my wife. She's the best part of my life, God. Peace out. <laughs> I wrote that. And then this is funny. I go, oh yeah, had a small anxiety attack last night. Screw you, Satan. It won't work. <laughs> I'm just reading. I think it's okay to say that every now and then. I continued writing about that. I said, I was worried. I'm worried about the meeting with Scott Brugman. 
I had met this guy named Scott Brugman who was in Denver, Colorado, who was going to start a thing called Red Rocks Church. And he asked me if I would come join him and be the senior pastor and help start the church. Well, it seemed so weird and it seemed so random and I was scared to death and didn't know what to do. I'm worried that the meeting with Scott Brugman won't go well. And I'm worrying, worried that it will go well. I'm just afraid. Just a kid like about to put his family through stuff that he doesn't even know what he's getting into. All I knew is I'm about to lose my job and lose my health insurance and my wife is pregnant and I, we got no money and I'm scared to death. This is uh, July 16th, 2004. God, I feel bipolar or something. One day I'm ready to tackle the world and the next two days I'm depressed and just want to sleep. You know that feeling? One day I'm going to build the best church on the planet. The next day I don't want to care about or talk to anyone. God help me. God lead me. God comfort me. I'm so sorry I'm so needy and selfish sometimes. I wonder why you pick somebody like me. I'm nervous. I'm excited. I'm scared. I'm confused. Help me to be a good husband and father. Thank you for Jill and Ethan. Austin hadn't been born yet. All right, last one. <clears throat> Some things went down. We met with Scott. We felt peace. Didn't have all the puzzle pieces put together, but we're going to move to Denver now. We're going to partner with Scott and BZ and Todd and Chad. We're going to start a church. Pastor announced to the church that I'm leaving next month. Well, it's official. I'm out of here. Weird. I've been there for eight years. God, I need you. And I put an exclamation point. Right now, I need a buyer for our house. I need a salary. I need health insurance for my wife. And I need a free place to live. Praise God, we have a great sense that Denver is the deal. I was reading that last night, and I actually chuckled at that part. I'm like, what gave you the sense that Denver was the deal? Nothing was working out. As I read through those pages last night, about four or five different journal entries, I put, God, please help us with health insurance, because Jill's pregnant. I'm afraid we might have complications and have hospital bills we can't pay off for the rest of our lives. Would you please get us a place to live? We don't have that, and I don't know what to do, but we're going. And uh, right before we left town, I got a call from someone in the finance department at our church that we just left, and she said, you know what, pastor just on a whim, Call me today and say he changed his mind, and we're going to pay for your health insurance until Jill has the baby. I start crying. <laughs> God's with me. He's paying attention. We're packing up the U-Haul. Don't know where I'm going to live. Girl calls me. There's 15, about 15 people that said we're going to be a part of this church. One of them called me, and she goes, hey, I'm about to get married, and um, I was just about to sell my condo, but like, if that would help you, I could hold off, and you guys could just live there free for a while. God's with me. God's watching. He cares. All I saw when I was writing all those journal entries was a struggle. If this is your church, as you know, in 2019, I had a real hard time with anxiety and depression. Didn't think I was going to ever be a pastor again. Um, didn't want to live a lot of days. Like, it was bad. Took a lot of time off work. You know what I did probably once a week in 2019? I read that. And I went, I was scared then. And I didn't know how it would turn out then. But God got me through it. And if God could get me through this, then he can get me through this. I'm going to remember carefully. And what I didn't know is in 2019 is that in 2022, we were going to get some scary news from a doctor about my brain. And so now it's 2022, and I look back to 2019, and I go, in 2019, I just wanted to die most days. In 2022, it's a memorial, because God got me through that, and God got me through that. God's going to get me through this. See how that works? That's how we build a memorial. <clears throat> Two challenges for you. Number one, build a memorial. Would you take this really, really serious? It sounds simple. I'm telling you, it's game-changing. Start today. 
at least get it done in the next few days if at all possible. Take some real time, whether it's your laptop, your phone, paper, carve it in a tree, whatever you do, write down a list of things. Think through this and pray about this. God, help me remember the things you've brought me through. And every one you write down is one of those stones. I was scared to death, but God got me through it, so I'm gonna take that memory. And he brought me through this too, and I never saw that coming, but I'm gonna take that memory. I'm gonna build a memorial because you're gonna need it. God says, I want you to trust me. I want you to know that I'm going to get you through this. And the, the, the amount of peace and joy and confidence that you walk through with every single day is going to be completely determined on whether or not you decide to focus on what I can do or what you see. And I'm saying, God says, I'm telling you guys, I got better in store for you. I got life to the fullest. I got peace in the middle of crazy situations. And to get that, I want you to remember carefully what I've brought you through and remind yourself and the devil and anyone else who tries to tell you it won't work. He got me through that. He's going to get me through this. Yes, I can. I want you to build a memorial. My second challenge is choose to think about it often. Don't, don't, don't get one of these and then throw it in a drawer and don't look at it for the next six months. In fact, when you build this memorial, plan on reading it at least once a day for a while. If you're in the middle of a struggle, maybe three times a day for a while. I'm not kidding. Read it out loud. Tell God thank you for every single one of them out loud. Call somebody up and say, I just want to brag on God today because he's done some things in my life and I got to tell somebody. You start talking about this. You start thinking about this. You start thanking God for this list. I'm telling you, things start to change. Peace starts to replace anxiety. Joy starts to, re to replace depression. Confidence starts to replace scared to death. It just does. This is what Paul told some of his best friends in Philippi to do. This is one of the most famous passages in the Bible that actually talks about how to get rid of anxiety and when you're scared, when you're fearful, when you're overwhelmed. He says this, finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, and then he sums the whole thing up. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. If you do this, if you choose to focus on things that are praiseworthy and the God of peace will be with you. If you decide... I'm gonna focus on what's praiseworthy instead of what's problematic. Paul says the byproduct is peace. It's a choice. It's a choice that we have to make. I can't control thoughts that hit my head sometimes, but I can absolutely control how long I think about them. So can you, right? And when we're struggling, the thoughts of negativity and oh my gosh, and what's gonna happen and how's it gonna turn out and it doesn't look good, those come up all the time. So every single time we do what the Bible says, I'm going to take that thought captive. I'm going to kick it out of my head, and I'm going to decide instead of focusing on what's problematic to focus on what's praiseworthy because I know that peace is a byproduct when I do that. So don't just make this, build this memorial, memorial but look at it often. This is something that, that I feel like I'm doing right now huh, about 20 times a day, maybe 50 on some days. I got this health thing going on, and the truth is, nobody can tell me how it's going to play out. I just met with a neurologist last week. You might have another good year. You might have another good 10 years. We don't know. Everybody's different. But he said, you, you should expect change. I think about it every day. And every day when I think about it, my goal is I pray for a miracle and then I focus on something praiseworthy. I get to decide if I focus on the, the fears or not, right? So the other day, I was getting ready to go out in my backyard and play basketball with the kids. And I had this thought creeped up in my head. Wonder how long you're going to be able to do this. Because according to the neurologist, not forever. Now, my temptation is to instantly get sad and think about that and have a pity party for the next three hours. But I've just started to learn. No, no, no. I've lost too many days already to this stuff. I've lived through too many days without experiencing the peace and joy from God because I decided to focus on the problem instead of on what's praiseworthy. 
And so literally the other day I had that thought and I went, no, I'm not going to think about that. That doesn't matter. I have today. Tomorrow has enough worries of its own. I'm going to focus on today. And today I got some things to be praiseworthy for. My wife is unbelievable. My boys are amazing. This church family's more than I ever could have dreamt of being a part of something like this. And then I go to things like, I have what a lot of people don't have today. I actually have access to clean drinking water and I have so much food in my house that we'll end up throwing some of it away because we won't eat it all. And then I get real spiritual and I go, and if I, don't, if I can't find anything else to be thankful for today, Jesus Christ died on a cross to pay the price for my sins. I get to be forgiven. I get his spirit. I get heaven forever. I got a lot to be praiseworthy about. Let's go play basketball. It's a choice. And right now I'm in this season where I'm making that choice nonstop. And I want to challenge you to do the same thing. Because your God is good. Your God is with you. Your God is working. Your God has a plan. Even when you can't see it, smell it, figure it out. And one of these days, what you're going through right now is going to be a memorial. But you get to decide how, life is, how, how you experience life until then. Do I spend every day focusing on the problem and sad and having a pity party? Or do I decide, no, I'm going to remember carefully what my God's already brought me through. I'm going to remember carefully the things that are praiseworthy in my life. And I'm going to focus on those things and I'm going to have a good day and the God of peace is going with me. That's what I want for you right there, church. We're going to end today by focusing on the most praiseworthy thing in human history. the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, we're commanded to remember this one. And you remember this one, it changes everything. Paul's telling some of his friends about the night that Jesus had his last meal with his disciples before he would be arrested and then flogged and then beaten and spit on and punched and kicked and thorns and on the cross and a spear in his side. He says this, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you're at a physical building right now, there should be a little communion element somewhere near your chair. Go ahead and grab that. If you are at home, man, grab some supplies and make do with whatever you got. I'd love for you to join us in communion. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to explain why we do communion real briefly, and then we're going, to, we're going to worship. The band's going to do their thing, and I want you to take a few moments and remember carefully what Jesus did for you on the cross. Remember carefully how it's changed your life. Remember carefully the things he's brought you through. Remember carefully the things that you have to, to praise about, right? This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take a moment. We're going to go, God, help me to remember carefully. Help me to not take those things that you've brought me through for granted. Help me to not take what you did for me on the cross for granted. For me, I, 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 try, I usually go through a little punch list of what I do when I take communion. And I'm always like, God, search me. And if there's something going on, man, forgive me and help me realize it. And I just start saying, thank you. Thank you that you died for me. Thank you that your body was broken for me. Thank you that your blood was spilled for me. Thank you that I can have my sins forgiven today and go to heaven for all of eternity. Thank you. I remember. And then we take communion. Okay, so that's what's going to happen. Deal? If you're at a physical location, would you stand up? I'm going to pray. I'm going to give you a chance to respond. Then I'm going to get out of the way, and they're going to sing. And during this song, you take communion when you feel it. God, I thank you that your presence is absolutely with us today, no matter where we're watching or listening from, that you are here and you are speaking. I pray, God, that you continue to speak to us as we enter into worshiping you with music. God, help us to never forget the things that you've done for us, the things you've brought us through, 
the things you've done to bless our lives, the praiseworthy things that you have done in our lives. And God, help us to never forget what your son did for us on the cross and that we can lean on that, that no matter how we feel, we are loved and we are welcomed and we are valued and we are accepted. You said you loved us so much, you let him die for us. That's how badly you want to do life with every single one of us. Help us to remember that, never forget that. With everyone's eyes closed at all the campuses, I just want to ask two questions. First one is this. I feel overwhelmed. And I need some help. God, I want to remember what you've brought me through so that it'll build my faith and peace and joy and confidence for what I'm going through. If that's you right now and you say, that's my prayer today, raise your hand, we're gonna pray together. Yeah, it's real. Second question is this. You, you know that you don't actually have a relationship with Jesus. And what he did for you on the cross, you haven't actually taken advantage of yet. But you can feel it in your heart. Oh, you don't know how it's gonna turn out. You know you won't be perfect. But right now you can feel it in your heart. That's the God of the universe lovingly drawing you into a relationship with him. And you just kind of know it like this is my moment. I'm going to ask God to forgive me of my sins. I'm going to take him up on this free gift of salvation. I want his spirit inside of me and I want heaven forever. And I just know it. This is my moment. I say yes to Jesus today. If that's you right now, raise your hand at every single location. Keep him up. Raise him up high. Come on, God behind bars. Austin, Brussels, God, we love you so much. We thank you for what you're doing, for how you're speaking to us right now, for the lives that are being changed right now. God, I pray for every single person who is feeling overwhelmed, that they would, they would get a sense of your spirit right now in such a unique and an authentic way that they would know inside of their being, they would know that you've got everything under control that you've got their future under control, that you've got their present situation under control. You got them through stuff in the past. You're gonna get them through this. God, I pray for faith to rise up. And I thank you for every single person who decided to say yes to you today, Jesus. I thank you for the eternal lives that are being changed right now, literally across the world. God, we love you. We're grateful. We remember what you did on the cross and we say thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Let's worship.